Welcome back to Capital Today. You're rejoining me, Ben Ibrahim, and Tansri Dr. Dr. Yusuf Basiron, who is the CEO of the Malaysian Palm Oil Council. And he's given us a very insightful view, very insightful view indeed, about the Malaysian palm oil industry, the internal and external success stories and challenges, which is what business is all about. Tansri, thank you very much for being with us once again. You shared with us some very interesting insights into this yeah. well industry, an industry which has many perceptions, as you alluded to much, much earlier. But Tansri, moving forward in terms of this discussion, can you tell us in very layman's terms about the RSPO, which is an international governing body of the industry? The RSPO was an NGO initiative to introduce certification scheme for sustainably produced palm oil. Mm. And they have developed various uh, criteria and uh, standards uh, detailing out how production of palm oil should be carried out in order to, be, to qualify for being uh, certified as a sustainably produced palm oil for the palm oil that is being produced. So uh, by promoting this uh, scheme, they have attracted members uh, from the producers, Malaysia, Indonesia, traders, bankers, Investors NGOs, well. and all those who are uh, linked to the palm oil supply and trading chain. And having members, therefore, makes this uh, whole uh, RSPO as a fairly significant body to encourage uh, their uh, so-called initiative to be adopted uh, by the producers of palm oil here in Malaysia and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Problem is, the initial intention was very noble that if you can show and prove through certification that your palm oil is uh, produced sustainably, right. then buyers in Europe would have no problem in buying this uh, and consuming this certified palm oil. Uh, problem is uh, being an NGO initiative, the RSPO keeps on changing their rules and, and regulations. Yeah. And this rule changing uh, happened to be done on a vote basis in which the producers are no longer a commanding voice in the voting process. Mm. So more and more the producers feel uh, left out in the voting system and rule making system mm -hmm. because they are minority right. in terms of voting so, uh, power. If I'm hearing you correctly, so actually, there's a it becomes an, an unfair yeah. uh, scheme that the Producers are feeling uh, not worth pursuing and some like the Malaysian Palm Oil Association are thinking they yeah, are well, thinking Yeah, well that was my about, next question. You know, I hear a little know. bit of frustration yes, there yes. and like hence the word unfair. Is that why the Malaysian Palm Oil Association is thinking of, well, divorcing itself from this international body? Yeah, when the original uh, objective and the original uh, intentions are no longer fulfilled and being hijacked more and more by NGOs you know to suit their own agenda and more or less having a, a, a claim and control over the palm oil supply process that would disadvantage the producers right. and therefore <coughs> that is one possible reason why the uh, M POA, Malaysian Palm Oil Association, wants to withdraw. The Indonesian Palm Oil Association has withdrawn from membership a uh, few years ago, so for the same reason. And in Indonesia, they replace uh, their own version of the sustainability scheme called ISPO, right. Indonesian uh, Sustainable uh, Palm Oil. Mm -hmm. Malaysia is thinking similarly with a Malaysian version called MSPO. So, but this is not yet uh, introduced, but when it is introduced, perhaps MPOA may actually want to withdraw from RSPO and support MSPO instead. Right. So this is like the politics of the... The <laughs> politics, well, no industry is perfect. Of the palm oil trade. No yeah. industry is perfect, Tansri. But if I hear you correctly, what you're telling our viewers about the industry because this segment is very much about education of certain industries and 
no different here today with the Malaysian palm oil industry, its internal and external challenges and success stories. But if I hear you correctly, especially from our discussion this morning, a lot of your challenges come from the NGO front. Now, what, in summary, in just in pure summary, what are the NGOs wanting in terms of the running of this industry? Because like you said, they have their own views, yeah. very come across as extremely yeah. strong, and in this case, extremely influential. So in summary, what is their main objective and goal? The NGOs are anti uh, deforestation. They okay. don't want deforestation. They think that as environmental NGOs, they should keep forests uh, as forests and not be cut to be converted to agriculture, uh, land, and so on. Uh, and palm oil becomes an easy target because uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, every inch of our land. Uh, is or was originally forest. Yes. And so, so talking about deforestation every time we develop agriculture, it has to be a case of deforestation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the West, the developed countries have developed and their land deforested long time ago. So mm -hmm. they don't see deforestation taking place anymore. Right. But we are a developing country. We mm -hmm. have not developed yet. Right. And we still need to deforest land that has been designated as agriculture land. Right. They have to remove the trees because right. uh, this is for agriculture, not for forests. At the same time, we are quite contented that we have conserved our forests by committing to keep half of our land area as permanent forest. Right. So there is no issue for us about deforestation because the forest that we want to have as forest mm -hmm. is still forest. Mm -hmm. But the one that we want to develop as agriculture should be allowed to be developed as agriculture. Right. But because of this uh, different, uh, let's say, phase of our development, the developed country NGOs think that all over the world there should be no more deforestation mm -hmm. because they have developed and we should not develop our forests. When forest you say industry. developed countries of the NGOs, are you talking more from Europe and North America? or? Yes, yeah. I think uh, the Japanese uh, also are developed uh, in, as, uh, is also a they are also a developed country. Oh, very much so, yes. Very much. But they do not, uh, uh, and they do not uh, let's say, uh, follow the, the approach taken by the EU or Europe and US. They understand uh, the need of the developing countries to develop. Mm -hmm. So that need is a sovereign right, meaning uh, nobody should stop us from developing. Right. And so they of monitor course. this well and cooperate with us how to develop sustainably. Right. Whereas Europe and US, they use their NGOs to impose their will yes. uh, against development mm -hmm. and not to cut any more forests. Mm -hmm. uh, simply perhaps as a strategy because the main source of deforestation is by their cattle industry and their soybean and sugarcane industry, their own industry is still deforesting. But to camouflage all these deforesting activities, they use their NGOs to kind of uh, campaign against deforestation, focusing on palm. And therefore, you know, this is uh, a buying time for them that they can continue to deforest even much, much more than Malaysia or Indonesia put together. Right, because right. this is their bread and butter. They need to depend on agriculture. They need to depend on beef or on cattle production in order to survive their economy. Right. So we are therefore seeing some unfair, sorry, unfair and double standards being imposed. Of course. We are not yet developed and yet we are preventing from developing. And, and being attacked at the same time. And, and, and being uh, demonized for no good reason. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if they want for us, we have more than enough for yes, us. You know? right. So, but this country, is the dilemma of yeah. a developing country let, 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 trying let, to let, beat yeah. you know, the marketplace. That's uh, right. yeah, let, with let's our talk commodity. about that dilemma. Now, when these, just give us a bit of an example that when these NGOs come at you strong, they want A, B, C, and D, and like you said, it's in relation to deforestation, how does countries like Indonesia and Malaysia was sell it to them and, well, rebut? their views and arguments because at the end of the day, I mean, 
if you look at the simple economics of this, okay, if you say to them, look, okay, we understand where you're coming from, deforestation, not very good for the environment, all of the above. However, we as an economy, we need to progress. We need to give people jobs. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. need to make sure our numbers are good so we can move forward. How do you sell it to them? Is that the way you sell it to them or is, that, is there another way? Well, the government uh, is always uh, providing, is always providing this uh, basic information about uh, how we produce our palm oil, how we run our forests, mm -hmm. how we run our country. <coughs> we are good citizens of the world. We are right. not out there to destroy the, the, no, the environment and so on. Sure so yeah. these uh, messages, uh, you know, we, we broadcast to governments, to the West and, and so on and so forth. But uh, the issue is, the West now, uh, they employ the NGOs as part of their civil society uh, scheme. And the NGOs are funded by the, by the Western government. So they get a lot of funds. And what do they do with the funds? You know, they start looking for mm -hmm. uh, issues to, right. promote, <coughs> to promote to their advantage. Mm -hmm. So I suppose if they uh, reduce production of palm oil through all this mm -hmm. anti-palm oil campaign, there would be more room for the uh, Western countries to produce their own oils right. and market their own oils. In other words, improving their competitive yeah, yeah, stance yeah. by using their so-called NGO agents mm -hmm. to kind of diminish the competitiveness of uh, competing oils like palm. Yeah, so right. this is to me, uh, although a, a strategy that can legally be adopted, but it's also an unfair, uh, sometimes even uh, brutal it strategy, is, sounds, sounds you know, very preventing, brutal, yeah. preventing produce of farmers from reaching markets in, in, in France or in yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah. So that is not fair. It's mm. not something that uh, they commit in terms of world trade commitment where, yeah. you know, trading uh, market access would be facilitated. Right, right. Rather, this is just the opposite, you know, trying to prevent market access. Yeah. Now, Tatsui, let's talk about the ecosystem of the industry because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do and your colleagues are trying to do is create that valuable ecosystem which is always developing for the better regardless of challenges. Yeah. Now, in terms of the ecosystem, one trend that I notice is that many investors, not well, as a strong word, many, some investors in Malaysia are investing in Indonesian palm oil rather than resources, rather than Malaysian palm oil resources. Your comments on that? Well, we are good at producing palm oil with our technology and, and, and experience. And we are not a big country, therefore limited land for agriculture because we have to keep a lot of our land under forest. So in that sense, we have to look for countries that can offer the right uh, availability of land and labor mm -hmm. and climate, of course. of course. And Indonesia LLC, is land, labor and climate. <laughs> Very easy yeah. to remember, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Indonesia is one of the opportunities uh, for us to uh, invest in and produce palm together with them. Yeah. Why not? And they have a lot of land, a lot of labor. Well, so we as long as we do it uh, within the uh, legal uh, framework provisions mm -hmm. of a country <coughs> and uh, abiding by some let's say uh, sustainability criteria yeah. this should be uh, promoted because yeah. the world is in need of this oil of course but wouldn't on the flip side wouldn't some people be saying you know in decision makers within the industry internally in Malaysia said hey what's going on there you know are you supporting Indonesia shouldn't you be supporting yeah, yeah, you yeah. know the internal front you know I mean there is always that element of that you know yeah, but this is a borderless world in terms of, you know, business. Okay. When we <laughs> do business, it is with a view to enhance the uh, business uh, opportunity as well as the, 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 the growth of the own okay. country, you okay. know, okay. Where, the, where we do business. So okay. growth first. it is always mutually beneficial. Mutually beneficial. Otherwise, it won't work. <laughs> now, speaking of making it work, is there, because Malaysia and Indonesia are the two biggest countries in this market, now, is there a quota in terms of export quota that countries abide by that how much they can export to a certain country? Is there any sum of control in that matter? No, no, no. We, we, we know the market is uh, short of oil. From okay. year to year, we have to produce 
six million tons more oils right. and fats. Right. The Western countries, other countries cannot produce as much, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, not even half, mm -hmm. not even one third of that, you right. know, regularly. Six million tons of new oil for them would require 60, uh, let's say 60 million hectares of land. Right. That is not possible. Right. And it is only possible if we combine with the effort from pump. Okay. So there is no quota necessary to be arranged. Okay. But of course, during a period of depressed prices, yep. we have our biodiesel market to turn to, okay. to consume more oil to remove excess stock. Because the reason I asked that question, because in the year 2011, Indonesia changed its yes. export quotas and that affected how some of the Malaysian companies did their business and sort of achieved their results and whatnot. So that was the reason I was asking. But what was the main learning curve from that decision by our Indonesian counterparts in 2011? Well, if you try to uh, play the market to your own advantage mm -hmm. without considering the partner, like Did they Malaysia, consult? Of course, they consult, yeah. but mainly for their advantage of encouraging downstream processing. Mm -hmm. What happened is the market price will, uh, will come down. Of course. And both countries will lose a lot of export revenue in mm -hmm. terms of value mm -hmm. because prices have come down to a much lower level compared to the previous time. Right. So the lesson is if you uh, try to play the market uh, without considering the overall picture, you, you tend to lose value and mm -hmm. both will lose. It's a lose lose strategy. It's a lose strategy. So now what we do is we say Indonesia will ensure uh, palm oil is never in much excess mm -hmm. by having their own biodiesel industry develop. I think they're talking about B10 blending 10%. Mm -hmm. We're talking about B5, B7 blending 5 or 7%. So this will remove that potential excess supply and therefore create an uh, uh, improved price situation again. Right. So that wa that's what has happened. So what we learn is that uh, we should not <laughs> You know, play the game alone. We yeah, have to uh, well, that's, take that, into that, that's account. That's a very good the, point. You've taken the words right out of my mouth. Not playing the game alone because nothing is forever. Now you said yeah. this industry needs a very good climate. Now you look at other Southeast Asian countries like your Myanmar's, your yes, yes. and other Thailands of this of the region. You know, they've got the climate to do it. They've also got more manpower to do it in terms yeah, yeah. of people. Like, can you see them sort of catching up with Malaysia and in, in Indonesia? in the very near future? Sorry, they don't have the climate. Yeah. They have a long period of drought within a year, mm -hmm. two, three months. Mm -hmm. And this will affect their oil palm yield. Right. And therefore, they would not be as competitive. But surely, I mean, that's something that they can look at, no? Well, if they want to irrigate, they have a river, but sometimes the rivers also dry up during right. the drought, drought which period. Can, which country specifically? All the countries outside Malaysia <laughs> and okay. Indonesia, right. they right. are subjected to drought. Right. Uh, the countries are not, let's say, um, uh, I misinformed. They right. know what they can and could not do. Of course. Uh, so they are aware so, of that so situation. Yeah. So they are aware and therefore history has told us that these countries don't have palm oil mm -hmm. and this is because they don't have the climate. Okay. okay. So they <laughs> don't have the climate. Okay. That's uh, another myth out there. Yes. Now, just coming towards the end of a very interesting and insightful and informative interview, and we thank you very much for that. But moving forward, what can we expect from the industry in terms of changes, developments, and just moving forward, really? Well, the industry is uh, trying to uh, become more and more efficient. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many small holders there mm -hmm. that are small in size, and if we can improve the size size factor uh, yeah. factor itself mm -hmm. that will help all our smallholders to earn a target income of 4000 ringgits per month for example which is what is desired when we reach a status of a developed country <coughs> by 2020 mm -hmm. so some kind of a reformation uh, reform of land size for the small players may be necessary going into the future right. but as far as palm oil is concerned we are only touching the tip of the iceberg, as they say, because there are so many valuable products to be tapped, to yes, be right. harnessed, to be commercialized from the palm oil industry. 
the biomass is in plentiful supply right now is not commercially utilized properly to add value to this industry the biomass industry alone could probably double the revenue of this industry wow. into the future okay, okay. the new uh, the minor components like the vitamin e the vitamin a research have shown them to be highly let's say uh, valuable uh, com uh, minor components which again can have a very high value uh, when commercialized that it will add 20 50 percent more revenue on top of what the palm oil industry is already enjoying right so i think we have to be patient and yet work hard to focus to develop all these opportunities from an industry that is already there you right. know right. so this uh, this is what i call a blessed industry right. all we have to do is tune in our brain power <laughs> to make it work even better for us well, well, patience is never a key attribute that many entrepreneurs have, but it's all about living and learning. And definitely, Tansri, we have learned a lot about the palm oil industry, not just the Malaysian palm oil industry, but the global palm oil industry. And on behalf of Capital Today, we'd like to thank you very much for coming in and giving us and making a very technical topic look extremely simple, something that not many people can do. And thank you very much again, Tansri. That's right, everybody. We've spoken to Tansri Dato Dr. Yusuf, who is the CEO of the Malaysian Palm Oil Council, talking about the industry's internal and external challenges and definitely success stories and definitely how is the best forward to move forward in this industry. We're just going to take a very short commercial break, but don't go away. More news coming your way right here on Capital Today.